Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship. On this program, we present the seven biblical dispensations, the key to Bible study and interpretation. If you would like a free copy of this message, you may view and or download it from our website at kjvbiblebelievers.com or listen for additional contact information at the end of the program. And now our study of the seven biblical dispensations. Dispensations in the Bible is the key to Bible study and interpretation, just like it says. It is. Noah lived in a different dispensation than you do. Noah was told to build an ark. You're not told to build an ark. That's a very simple example of being a dispensational Bible student. Anyway, God might use that ark you build in your backyard if you've got a yard big enough to hold an ark. But He's not actually telling you that, and that's because you understand you're not living in that dispensation. Now, if you want to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, read that with me. It's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Is everyone there? Read that with me. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, obviously, you're commanded there to study, and you want to be approved not to me, not to other people, but to God. Those are obvious truths. Uh, a workman. So it takes work. But look what it continues to say, rightly dividing the word of truth. You see, a lot of people just have this kind of whimsical attitude, I'll just read the Bible and I'll just take what I can from it. And they treat the Bible like a cookbook. If you want no-baked cookies, you open the cookbook, you look for no-baked cookies, and you cook it. You don't read the whole cookbook, you don't study the entire thing. And that's recommended for cookbooks. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend you try to study the whole thing. But the Bible isn't a cookbook. The Bible is a complete book. And no more would you pick up one of the famous, you know, pick up Moby Dick. Are you just going to read chapter 6 and then thumb through it and see if there's something else you might like? Moby Dick's hard enough to read and get anything out of it. <laughs> you better read it from start to finish or you're not going to understand anything about it. Name your book. If it's a novel, if it's a, any kind of a standard literary work, you read it from the start to the finish. That Bible is no different. And as you read it, you have to rightly divide it. And that's really what dispensationalism, or being a dispensational Bible student is. You rightly divide the word of truth. You, you look at what you're reading, and in your mind you put it where it belongs. And that's what rightly dividing the word of truth is. I gleaned this information from several different sources. Uh, Bullinger, Larkin, Oliver B. Green, H. I. R. Inside, uh, J. Vernon McGee, Peter Ruckman, uh, even Hal Lindsey's stuff. I mean, all kinds of people have these things. But this is a basic layout of the dispensations. What you're looking at from the eternal past to the eternal heaven, that is the entire revelation of Scripture in a chart. And when you're reading the Bible, you have to take a look at where it is you're reading and then interpret the Scripture with that in mind. Now, some people put names on these, like where I, I have Adam, they'll put... They call that the age of innocence because they were placed in the garden. They were innocent, sinless. And then the second one where I have Seth, uh, they call that human government. And they just give these titles. And I, I don't like adding anything to, you know, it, I, to me it just causes more confusion adding more words. The Bible gives us these dispensations, as you're seeing there, and at every turn or change from one dispensation to the next, he has a man. Now, there are differences. If you read that first dispensation between Genesis 1 and 3, there are things that are about them that aren't true of us, and I'm very thankful because I don't want to walk around naked. But that's what they did during that dispensation. They didn't wear clothes. It was at the end where he made coats of skin. So, raise a hand. How many of you wish we were in the age of innocence? So we could walk around. Don't answer that. I don't want to know. But <laughs> the, the, the main characters are listed there. The Lord, Adam, Eve, and the serpent. And then what happens? 
Each dispensation ends with judgment. And then we have what was called the fall. When Eve ate of the fruit, it wasn't an apple. It doesn't say apple in the Bible. So be careful to not add what's not there. It was called fruit. That's all. We're not sure what it was. And then that's the fall. So that's the end of the first one. Now the second one starts off with Cain and Abel. But the man that he builds upon is Seth. Later on we read about the sons of Seth, and when you read the genealogies, it's Adam begets Seth, and Seth begets, and it goes on down to our next dispensation. Well, it started when they were kicked out of the garden. And it began with hope. <laughs> and Cain and Abel and Enoch and Methuselah, we come down to Noah, and we all know what happened. The world got so evil that God decided to destroy it with a flood. That's the end of dispensation number two. So you can see the Bible is clearly laid out with these beginnings with hope and these end, endings with judgment. And so we'll come back to that chart in a minute. But I want you to look at Ecclesiastes. You want to turn there. We're going to read a couple, three verses. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes, of course, was written by King Solomon. And we're going to see that these dispensations have a time element to them. But it's not an exact thing as far as we understand it. I want to make that clear. If somebody tries to be just exact and tell you exactly where every dispensation begins and ends, there's several of them that kind of overlap. There's a few that have a little gap. Actually, we're going to see that after the rapture, there may be a, there is a gap of we don't know how long between the rapture and the seven-year treaty being signed. and So there's a gap between the end of the age of grace and that 70th week of Daniel and so forth. But God is the one who's in control. God has this thing all planned out. So we can, we can rest assured that it's all going to work out. Beginning in verse 11, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, read that verse with me. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Now, some folks will grab a hold of that and say, See, there's no use to even study prophecy. You can't know. The Bible says man can't know. What he's saying, if you remember, Ecclesiastes is written from the perspective of man on the earth, the flesh. And on your own, forget it. You can't figure it out. That's why you, uh, you go study the guys who tried to figure out God's plan. Nostradamus, Gene Dixon, that uh, John Edwards that's running around being, playing all psychic and everything. They have no idea. Uh, you know, I, I, I was uh, reading a story the other day about, you remember the psychic hotlines? And they'd show these weird people and they'd call and I'll tell you. You're... You know what's funny is they went bankrupt. Didn't they see it coming? See what I'm saying? I mean, if just a little common sense cures a lot of stupidity, there would be a lot of money saved by a lot of people if they just, you know, think about what they're doing. They call these psychic hotlines or go see John Edwards or whoever. That Silva Brown, Sylvia Brown, I think is her name. Uh, I mean, I don't want to be mean, but she just looked the part, if you know what I mean. But uh, God knows. Now, we may not know every detail, even with the Scripture. Uh, because he doesn't tell us everything. But he has laid out his plan. Uh, read uh, verse 14. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 14. Read that with me. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it that men should fear before him. Now you all know I'm a big uh, patriot. <laughs> I love my country, and I know you do too. And I'm all about stopping the New World Order as far as dimming the tide of evil. Like Matt prayed, that we could be used of God and that God would stem the tide of evil. I'm all for that. But, don't think for a minute that that involves changing God's plan. God is going to work this thing out the way God wants to, and we're not going to change that. But the only question is, do you know exactly how God's going to work it out? No, we don't know exactly. We know the basics. 
We know there's coming a new world order that will, I mean, they've got one now, but there's coming a new world order that will totally control everything. Everything you, that those on earth buy, sell, and trade. Those who don't take the mark will have to go to barter. We're not going to stop that. And I, I love these guys, but a lot of these guys are out there saying, we can stop this, we can, you know... Uh, no, we're not. We can delay it in the sense that we can make sure that we do our part, that we are not the generation that just lets it happen. Um, but what I pray and hope that I, f the way I got it figured out is the rapture takes place before it all happens, and I hope that's how it works out. And I believe, I'm not just talking about the pre-trib rapture, but I mean as far as the New World Order setting up global government, we're close enough for my taste. I don't want to get into it anymore. Just pray that it we, we see the evil tide stemmed until the time of the rapture, and then they can have it. But that uh, is the basis for dispensational study. You believe that God is in control. See? We do not believe in this God up there wringing His hands, worried that, oh, you know, that things may not... You know, that's not our God. Our God is in control, and we know that He's in control, and dispensations demonstrate that He has told us enough about what He's going to do. And again, as you look through this, you see that He's done it in the past. And if He did it then, and He didn't miss a beat, and never did a thing that He didn't say He would do, and never missed it and said, I'm going to do something, and didn't do it, did He? That makes sense? <laughs> He's 100% batting average. Every one of those in the green, chalk them up. God said it, He did it, that settles it. Amen. We're in this little area that's kind of off white there, the under grace. And uh, He's going to be working things out there. We'll come back to that in a minute. But if you will, turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Now, this is in the New Testament. We're going to read... Really the same thing that Solomon said, only spelled out much more clearly and dogmatically, that God has this thing called a dispensational plan, a plan of the ages. In Ephesians chapter 1, beginning of verse 10, just listen as I read. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10, he says, "...that in the dispensation of the fullness of times..." He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. So there's that word right from the Scripture, dispensation. And we see there that there's a dispensation He's referring to specifically, which we know is going to take place at the end of the tribulation and uh, the millennial kingdom. And then at the end of the millennium, He actually then... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 told us that He will then deliver that up to the Father, that kingdom. So it all works together. But in verse 11, I want you to read that with me. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. Now there's no arguing with this that God has ordained how this is all going to work out. It is predestinated, and what that means is simply this. God is going to do it. Man is not going to change it. The Satanists and people who think that they're going to somehow thwart the plan of God, they're following their father, Lucifer. And you go back to Isaiah 14, he thought he could change the plan of God, and it got him kicked out of heaven. You're not going to change it. And we have obtained an inheritance and we have that confidence of knowing that it's all predestinated in the power and authority and sovereignty of God. That He is going to make this happen. And it's a, it's a sure thing. It's a, I don't want to, you know, I hate to say the word sure bet, but, <laughs> but if you were ever going to gamble, gamble on God. It's a sure thing. 